you very much, Libra, um, dear friends. It's with great pleasure that I stand here before you today um, as your local professor in general practice. I am very grateful for the opportunity to introduce myself and my vision here. Uh, many people told me that I should smile a lot. That's probably best. So I'll <laughs> even, that, even, if, even that would seem a bit artificial, I'm, I'm trying to, um, to oblige to that uh, comment. Um, so I'm a lifelong student of uh, mind-body connections, actually. And I would really like to, uh, to demonstrate to you, to show you my learning journey so far, and to show you how my vision of general practice has developed over the years. Um, and since uh, Hippocrates, I think the business of medical schools was to train communities of care professionals. And I think, please come in, have a seat. I think um, uh, this medical school is an example of, of actually a very nice community. Uh, I worked in Manchester before, uh, and I felt that that have, has lost sight, had lost sight of his, um, sorry, of this core task a little bit of um, um, organizing a care community. I hope this works out. Um, so, so uh, I materialized. It's fine, I think. No, I think it works. Yeah, yeah. So I materialized in this uh, in this lovely uh, uh, BSMS uh, environment. Uh, I, I sometimes am a bit um, uh, confused and think, "Whoa, well, how did I end up here?" Uh, I started working in the UK in 2015, and this is a really very, very nice environment to work in. Um, you can't see the view now, but that's the view for my for my uh, uh, room uh, that I see all the time over the South Downs. Um, so it's wonderful, great to work here in this excellent medical school and this vibrant and, and beautiful. Um, city of Brighton, and I, I mostly actually, and that is what this talk is about, I enjoy the local focus. Uh, my good friend Otto is here, um, and, and we, we started out as GP trainees a long time ago, uh, and he's a, a full-time GP, so I always hesitate a little bit when I compare myself to him to describe myself as a GP, as Dutch GPs used to be available, Alex, um, round the clock. Um, and he works like that. Uh, but my insatiable curiosity uh, was impossible to combine with such uh, full-time availability for patient care. So, sorry. Uh, if only we had three lives. So, um, I've been a sessional GP for over 25 years. I should have been sort of a full-time doctor as well. I always feel a bit guilty, but yeah, what can you do in life? You have to uh, make choices. But I worked in what I can describe now, I think, as a more connected Dutch care. Um, ask Otto what that is about. It's a bit similar to here, I think, in, in, in large uh, uh, strokes. Huisartsen, as doctors in Holland are called, GPs, <laughs> Huisartsen. <laughs> um, they're community-based medical generalists, very similar to, to English GPs, but Dutch care, I think, works a bit better, or at least it works better together. It's not so fragmented, I would think. So the subject of my lecture is improving the GP toolkit from the bottom up. So I can hear you ask, what's a tool? Um, well, I like to use a big definition of tool. <laughs> this is my daughter's laughing. <laughs> She's done that all her life. That's a good lot. Um, so doctor's tools are a bit like kitchen aids, yeah? Uh, so the first aid that springs to my mind is, uh, is a chef knife, yeah, a chef's knife. Experienced cook, I cook a lot, uses a big blade all the time. Um, for all the kitchen tasks, actually. So uh, what I'm looking for in, in, um, in tools for GPs is such broad tools. I like to cook, and I like to use that great knife a lot. So, and I also hate it when people make it blunt and use it for me. Um, I need it to be very sharp. So a tool is to be very sharp and also personal almost. It's my tool. And I use tools here, like I said, in the broadest sense. Uh, listening, I think, can be a good tool for doctors, and a crucial tool, perhaps. Um, so I'm looking for, for tools in both teaching and research, and I look for tools that are sharp and robust, and that, that can uh, help doctors in encounters with people of uh, very, uh, varying complexity, and, and I, helped to aim to help, uh, sorry, I aim to help stakeholders to find these best possible tools. For instance, um, a backache that lasts for six weeks would suggest the need for more exercise. Very simple tool. And such a tool would help to define next steps. So you tell the patient, please do more exercise if there are no, flag, no red flags. So my wife, Johan, who was on the first 
row, the front row, um, would say that this lecture forces me, first of all, as a generalist, to tell you what I'm not going to do. And in short, I'm not going to do anything that doesn't support primary care practices. I see Krista, right? Uh, informing valuable connections with patients. I think that's probably my key aim. So what am I going to do? I hope to find that out with the field, actually, and to see what connectedness in Brighton & Hove, in the local area, East Sussex, um, means, and, and how connectedness could be uh, linked to um, my practice, my research, and, and the teaching that we do. I think I would do things perhaps slightly differently from other professors of general practice because I focus on connectedness as my key value, a critical value. So just about the structure of this lecture, I have three blocks for you for 50 minutes, 10 to 50 minutes. Um, and uh, introduction, I've started that. So I'll set the stage a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit my, about my heroes. And I'll speak a bit about the crisis, the NHS crisis. I think that's a really important theme to be thinking about as, as medical schools. It's, it's really an important thing. There was a paper in BMJ Open, I think, yesterday about the retention problem that many GPs now stop working as GPs. So there's a crucial issue, I think, how we can help the workforce to become GPs, medical students, how, how we can make it attractive for them to become doctors. So in the second part, I will explain about my core value, about connectedness, why I think that's an important um, value. I will present a short case, and I'll show you what happens when connections are missing. I see six community care tangents, so I'll talk to, to you about those six Cs, and I will take a brief look at types of knowledge that are available to understand uncertainty. I think that's really important for GPs. How can we deal with uncertainty? So in the second bit, I'll have a case, some tensions, and a brief, brief reflection on knowledge. Just a sip of water. In part three, I will show you how I want to introduce that connectedness value in teaching and in research. And finally, I will stop with some concluding remarks and, and come back to the NHS crisis. So after the stage, the setting of the stage, I, I come back now to the first block. And uh, I promised to tell you a little bit about my heroes. That's probably something I stole from Anjum. Where's Anjum? Uh, oh, there. Hi, Anjum in the back. He, he did his uh, inaugural lecture a few months ago. And I really uh, found that um, uh, quite interesting. So I, th I look back. I never had done that, actually, to look at my own uh, heroes. Uh, he showed us his champions uh, in his lecture. So these are a few of mine. This is Jan Groen. <coughs> I started, uh, started studying medicine in the late 70s, long time ago, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Professor Jan Groen was my first hero. He was born uh, to Jewish diamond workers. Um, he was about this big, actually, uh, which was interesting. He was quite deaf. Uh, and he had, go, had to go into hiding when the Second World War came, because he was Jewish. Uh, and he changed his name from Judah uh, to Jan. And his ideas on what he called psychogenesis are actually quite controversial, were quite controversial. He thought that, Christina, I don't need to tell you, um, that conflicts cause asthma. And that is now a thought that few people would think is a very good idea. It's incorrect and probably also stigmatizing. So at some point, there was a lot of um, um, yeah, discussion about his ideas. So he accepted a post as professor of internal medicine in Jerusalem. Uh, he had retired in, in uh, 1968, and he became an honorary chair in Leiden, where I studied, in psychobiology. In 1981, I joined his weekly learning group, where we studied connections between body and mind. It was a very interesting group. Every week, we sat with patients with long-term conditions, like uh, spina bif uh, bifida, uh, bifida sorry, and anorexia nervosa, and talked about their difficulties. It was a very instructive um, weekly meeting for me, and his key theme, to my surprise, was tenderness. I, was, I didn't expect to hear that in medical school, that tenderness is what it's all about. But I still totally agree. I, I uh, think that what he would call tenderness, I would call connectedness. It's probably a very similar concept. Um, and like me, his perspective was very broad, extremely broad, actually. He wrote 
hundreds of papers, co-wrote them, like me, co-author, not actually writing himself anymore, <laughs> sorry, um, and books. He was an epidemiologist, but he was a great clinical teacher, and he keenly showed that certain symptoms um, uh, were present in some patients, but he also very much interacted with them, with those persons. And, and that was not that common then, I think. Um, he acted almost as their servant, uh, which was, for me, very instructive. And my other hero, <laughs> he looks a bit <laughs> like, a, like a prison picture. Uh, but he was actually a very, very distinguished uh, gentleman called Jan Mulder. He was a GP in a town very close to where I lived and when I went to school uh, called Noordwijk. He's been a GP for 40 years, full-time GP. Uh, but he also... Um, um, set up one of the big uh, Dutch health centers in Holland, in Noordwijk. It was actually a very good center, and he co-founded the Dutch College of GPs. And his inaugural address uh, was called Working Together, GP and Specialist. He was a coach, I think, rather than an expert. And at the time, I found that... Is that me? No. A bit confusing. <laughs> um, he was energetic, direct, involved, and reliable. Uh, he was less keen on big concepts, however, and Jan uh, put generalism into practice. He was very much a hands-on man, and he wanted to learn and work together. To my surprise, I use his coaching style uh, all the time, by the way. Um, and, and both my heroes, interestingly, looking back on them, were over 65 when I first met them in Leiden, and they were most of all role models as doctors for me first, but they were also unconventional and approachable teachers and eclectic researchers perhaps a bit like me. I learned from these gentlemen that connectedness is the key, and as generalists, I think, they like the whole as much as parts. Or perhaps they like the connections between the parts and the people the most. I think that's probably what generalism is, to look at connections most of all. So my last point for this intro block, to set the context for my lecture, is that with my Dutch eyes, I see what I would describe as a crisis in the healthcare system in this country, in this country uh, the UK crisis in primary care. I think with many of you, I've, I've talked about this already. Uh, but I wanted to have just a few words about why I think that crisis is probably not a good word to describe that. Um, I think primary care is also not at its root. If you look at it, crisis, if you look at the uh, background of that word, it means it comes from krino, it's a, it's a Greek word, and it means cri uh, um, it has the meaning of decide, decisions. It's not so much, as its noun says, uh, a sense of alarm, as we all know, but it, it means to decide, and it means, I think, that probably now is the time to decide about how to set up a healthcare system. So crisis time, I would think, is, is redesign time. So I think we need to quickly determine next steps and, and think about how we can introduce medical generalism in this school a bit more, put it on the agenda, uh, a bit more, and think about the setting <coughs> split, the setting split between primary care and secondary care. And I think that is probably the heart of this crisis, or what I would like to call a redesign thing. I think we need partition, but not integration. And, and as I said, my PhD supervisor, Jan, uh, was a big uh, um, fan of um, bringing in, in specialists into primary <laughs> care, for instance. So. As a keen student of Jan Mulder, my, my point of view of, of uh, wanting integration and not participation, uh, oops, sorry, partition might not surprise you. I think we need better ways to combine primary care holistics with the specifics of secondary care. Um, I think by definition, a divide means confusion. It creates a barrier to dialogue for us as uh, customers of care. Um, it creates fog around the objectives and the terms of engagement. Who is my doctor? Who is my nurse? Is it in the hospital? Is it uh, someone <coughs> in my primary care practice? Especially for people with chronic conditions, that's usually a big problem, I think. Who is now leading my care, coordinating my care? I think this setting split disenfranchises coordination. It puts GPs also at risk. I had a letter this morning, by the way, about the new GP indemnity scheme, reducing my indemnity to a third of what it was. So it's, that's a big step forward, I think. Um, but it's really very expensive to indemnify yourself in this country compared, for instance, to Holland. 
Um, so there's big risks, I think, for, for GPs. One of the reasons probably, or many of the reasons why they don't want to become GPs. And this might be an important thing for them to have less financial uh, worries about indemnity. So I think most people would agree that medicine works best if it combines holistics with specialist expertise. It's really funny to, to have Jan look at me all the time, by the way, because he's died a long time ago. Uh, he's influenced me very much. Um, and to tell you a little bit about um, uh, how that works for me, last year my cholesterol was a little bit elevated. And I, I think I can talk, for instance, to my nurse, Jackie, from the Health and Wellbeing Centre in Brighton. Colleague. Um, I, very well. She knows me. I have a space, safe space for, dis for discussion. And for me that worked very well. So I lost about a stone uh, and my cholesterol dropped. So I think that's probably why it's so important to have good places to go to. So I think we should call it the big NHS redesign. So what would that redesign of medical generalism look like? So my job, I think, but I would look to Malcolm for that, is to, to improve conditions under which workers uh, will find medical generalism attractive again. So in the triangle, I would think of teaching, research, and practice, and care. So I would see facilitation as my job description. And I think a BMS, a BSMS can lead that um, development, perhaps, and to be at the forefront of such um, yeah, a revival of generalism, perhaps, what I would hope. So to finish off this first uh, 15 minutes intro block, I'm going to say a few words in Dutch. I think you're all afraid of that. <laughs> well, most of the English people would be <laughs> uh, as a welcome to my Dutch guests here. Heel hartelijk welkom, geweldig om jullie te zien. Dank voor jullie komst. Um, I do have a, word, a few words of caution about this place. Please don't worry, it's not about Brexit. <laughs> sorry, I, I mentioned that word, sorry. The locals here talk about the seagulls a lot. You might wonder who they are. They, they usually refer to the football club that lives just uh, no, that way, at the Amex Stadium, just to the left of this building. But they also may refer to dangerous birds. If you walk around here, you see all kinds of uh, signs. Uh, that the birds are actually dangerous and may snatch the food from your hand. So, so be, please be careful when you walk around here during your daylight. Um, so now I'm stepping into, st into part two of my lecture and um, um, I, I set the stage. In the first bit I, I talked about my heroes, I sketched the need for redesign and in this bit I would like to uh, talk about um, my core value, connectedness. And I will show you what happens when connections get lost. Uh, in one of my own cases. It's probably not a very good story for me. Um, but to introduce what I think uh, is needed, I also share six community care tensions with you. And to explain connectedness further, this is an academic session. Uh, so I, I'll go into uh, uh, philosophy, the philosophy of knowledge, a little bit. I like a, f uh, a German philosopher called Hans Georg Gadamer. Uh, he talks about hermeneutic understanding. He sees dialogue as the foundation of scientific knowledge. So I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So a case, the tensions and the philosophy. So to demonstrate what I mean by connectedness, I have a brief case history for you. As one of my first patients here a few years ago came to consult with me about his tiredness. Always a bit of a difficult consultation usually, I don't know many doctors here. Um, but for me, tightness is always slightly complicated. He was a 57-year-old smoker, and he had, had a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, seven years ago. And he seemed concerned to me about the recurrence of his uh, heart attack. He had no chest pain, no ex abnormalities on examination. So, um, however, we had no prior contact together, so he understandably didn't trust me very much, I felt. And obviously, we had also different backgrounds. So because of his anxiety, I felt we didn't actually reach common ground on his reason for the encounter. So some tests, as it goes, some tests were suggested by me to reassure him. And I wrote down tiredness. And all tests, as is usually the case, turned out to be normal. So that week he saw two A&E um, departments and two he made two extra practice visits to the practice without abnormalities, um, and he saw a nurse practitioner, finally, one of my colleagues, and she wrote down influenza, and she prescribed antibiotics. Um, 
but these do not work for influenza. So this was an understandable, but I think redundant intervention. And it led to more disconnection. The patient was actually totally at a loss who was now responsible for his care. So this is, I think, how a core value in primary care can get lost. And connectedness disappeared before we could even start to work. So uh, this was just one case. There's obviously many more. Um, but was just to, to introduce the, the idea of connectedness. And, and if you look at connectedness in primary care at the moment, I see six tensions at least, or perhaps even more. And the first one I see is that it's, like in my case, it's, it's usually very complicated to reach common ground. I think in this case, we reached common ground, the picture that I showed. But that was easy because this was actually for like a show, and the lady was actually the, one, one of the people in the administration office. <laughs> so this is uh, probably much better than it might in, in, in real life be. Um, so to talk about common ground a little bit, um, I, I'm not sure many of you know the book by Ian McWinney and um, Moira Stewart um, called Patient-Centered Medicine. It has been, I think, hugely influential in primary care. Um, and one of the concepts they describe in that book is called weaving. It's a bit of a vague concept, but I think many primary care practitioners, nurses and doctors and people working in, in, at the cold face of medicine would describe that idea of weaving a story, um, sort of co-design dimension, a crucial co-design dimension of, of um, figuring out why the patient has come, talking to them about their symptoms, about their ideas, and then eventually coming up with a potential explanation for their symptoms and coming up with a plan. But I think this weaving is juxtaposed fundamentally to the conventional hospital approach. In primary care, a solution may, may only appear through subsequent consultations. The weaving happens in the consultation, between the consultation, and it helps tolerate, uh, GPs tolerate ambiguity, I think. But that's not the way that hospitals work, I think. They mostly focus on excluding illness. And specialist training, I think, in the Netherlands, but I like to hear more about how that is organized here, is firmly focused on weaving-based learning, experience-based weaving of explanations that the patient is happy with. And my impression is that Dutch GPs may do more of such discussion-based stuff than the GPs over here. Perhaps I'm wrong. But I think it starts with establishing the reason for the visit, which is, sounds very simple, but it's actually really complicated often in real life because people may not know the reason for their visit themselves. So we <coughs> Dutch GPs would think that dialogue skills are probably the best tools for uncertainty management in primary care. That's the key core um, skill that you need. But doctors would need safe space to learn to weave and to find such common ground in skilled communication. So that's probably what medical schools are for and what's, what specialist training is for. Uh, the second tension I see, the second um, C, is the age of chronicity, which is actually yeah, quite a big problem, I think, for primary care. It's good to be able to care for so many people for their chronic illnesses in a, in a, a local environment. But many health problems are now chronic, so even cancer is often chronic. It's often a long-term condition. People live longer, uh, but they survive longer with, with their conditions, but also with many other conditions. So the consequences of such illnesses is, the consequence is that we now live with a lot of illnesses and live a very long time with a, a large number of medications. So for instance, a condition such as dementia is quite challenging for both a carer and the patient. How can such chronic care be organized in primary care practices that are already overloaded? I think that's a big question. The bulk of that chronicity is now transferred to primary care, but the resources, sorry to say, have not followed that. So an important example for me was mental health. When I just started out as a GP uh, in this country, I felt that it was amazing how fragmented that mental health care was. There's a long waiting list and referrals to my surprise to mental health kept bouncing back probably my fault, but I never had that in Holland. <coughs> Dutch GPs, like also here, um, employ mental health nurses, and I think mostly they're considered useful. So this is mostly about chronicity and, and the transition in our society, uh, and how we can help primary care teams to deal with that. So the third tension I see in primary care, the third C, 
is how to confirm the actual diseases in primary care, in general practice. Primary care has little new serious pathology. And the traditional approach, like I said, to that uncertainty is to exclude. So exclusion rules, probabilities. There are statisticians, I think, in the audience, Stephen. Um, so we teach how a certain test, like a question, will change the probability of disease from the probability when the patient comes in to afterwards. Um, and there's, when there's a big baseline level of uh, disease, like in a hospital, where there are many people with potential illnesses, that approach generally works very well. It's the traditional hospital approach. But however, we know very little of probabilities in primary care. We know almost nothing about prob probabilities outside of hospitals. Most people are healthy when they come to see a doctor. Some people have chronic illnesses, but there's a rare case that would have actually have a new major illness. So in primary care, I think we cannot exclude all possible rare disorders. That's not feasible. That wouldn't work. The inherent uncertainty in primary care would dictate, I think, talking about tools, about knives, that doctors um, rely on the broadest possible tools to confirm, talking about confirmation. That means dialogue skills, contextual experience, but mostly about their being rooted in the local community. They need to be visible for people um, to form relationships with healthcare and to, to um, cover this uncertainty. These are their big knives, I think, the primary care knives for the future. And Dutch GPs, talking about tools, also have their own guidelines. I think that's a big difference, such as the, the guideline for medically unexplained physical symptoms. That would tell you what to do as a GP. There's not a medically unexplained physical symptoms guideline in the UK. But they have these oh, for over 100 issues and they create a safe primary care space, I think. I think here GPs need to follow detailed, specialist, nice guidance. That's much more complicated. So after common ground, chronicity, confirmation, I think a fourth tension I see is the role of a gatekeeper. I, I call it to keep the C's, concierge. I think many f GPs find uh, this gatekeeper, doorkeeper role to be contentious. It's not simple. You want to keep people out of care. That's usually not making you very popular with them. They want to be referred to all kinds of uh, highbrow specialists. So to be a concierge is not a simple thing to do. And the NHS, because of its nature, has a lot of rules. That means a lot of gatekeeping. Um, so as I said, one of my weirdest experiences here was that my referral letters, I tried to make them as good as I could were rejected. And that probably means, in terms of gatekeeping, that that had been totally useless. Somebody else was closing the gate. Um, I never experienced it, something like that in Holland. So I think gatekeeping, the combination of gatekeeping plus openly accessible A&Es creates tensions in the surgery. And these can undermine trust. I think people find it very difficult if you say no um, um, and, and, and don't refer them. So the patient, in my case, didn't buy it. He, d he wanted to be referred. He wanted to have all kinds of tests. So GPs may want to act as doorkeepers, I think, but that's, in the real world, not always so simple. Because pa patients are not spineless objects coming into the room. They're, they're not accidentally walking into your surgery. They can be a confusing mix of visitors, complainants, and actual customers. So a visitor would just visit complainant would come to you to complain. Many people do that. <laughs> um, but only with our actual customers can we do, like this lady seems to be doing, can we do business. Yeah? We can only work with the people who actually want our advice. If you're giving advice to people that actually don't like your advice, they're not going to do it. So gatekeeping requires trust. Um, and, and to explain about health anxiety, like in my case, to a patient uh, in, in 9.22 minutes, who wants to know why he's so tired, is usually not very simple. It's not very simple to explain to people uh, when they start why questions. There's, medicine is, is uncertain, and why is usually um, uh, the start of a 20-minute conversation, at least. Uh, another thing is that Dutch GPs don't write fit notes. Occupational medicine in Holland is available to everyone. And that, I think, would also save gatekeeping. This concierging, I think, would need rethinking. It's a lot of work, and it's not very nice to do. 
So the fifth tension I see, another C, is related to coding. My code, to tightness, as I said, that was my judgment that I saw no pressing clinical issues. If you look at the literature, less than 2% of tiredness will become a serious illness. It mostly turns into depression. <coughs> so my colleagues didn't read my code like that. They, also, they didn't seem to read it at all, by the way. So coding seems unstructured, or at least less structured in this country. And I think uh, as uh, we are uh, looking at doing research around big data to understand decision making a bit better at least um, in general practice as one of our key research interests, those data are usually based on codes and, and the extent to which codes are actually reflecting clinical realities in my personal experience is usually very complicated. So this is not a simple task. And finally a sixth tension I see is the workforce, yeah? the workforce you see of crew I think thought about this a long time, crew. Um, after common ground, conicity, confirmation, concierge, coding, crew issues, I think are my sixth and perhaps most crucial tension. Uh, I had a conversation with Malcolm and he said that I would probably need to help um, turn at least 50% of our medical students into GPs at some point. Uh, that's a very ambitious <laughs> aim, I would think. Um, and, and at least and it, the NHS would need about 40% of the students to become GPs, whereas only a quarter would now take the GP path. I think that's probably the same in Holland, 25% of medical students become GPs. So reason, is, I think, for the GP crew crisis are that doctors seek a work-life balance, as everyone you know, So They see their job less, I think, as a vocation than um, perhaps when we started. Another thing is that medical autonomy, I think, is a bit more under threat in this country as the model of medical self-regulation has stopped in the 1990s. And Dutch GPs are more in the lead, I think. There's also more public liability, I just mentioned it already. Financial liability, GPs are responsible for the premises um, when they're partners and medical indemnity. So I think GPs, uh, many GPs would like this perhaps, but I think they should be um, NHS employees like the rest. And I think there's also underfunding with 8% of the NHS budget going to 90% um, of, sorry, less than 8% of the budget sponsoring 90% of the contacts. So most of the work is actually done for 8% of, of the money. That's something is wrong, yeah? Primary care has only a, big, a little slice of the, of the money. So Dutch medical schools also do vocational training. That's another thing that might strengthen vocational training for this country. I think it would be great for me if I could link more, a bit more with the deanery and if you could extend training for GPs. I think there are plans to, to turn that into four years now. Uh, I also promised a brief aside to another old man. Um, this is Hans-Georg Gadama and he is a philosopher of science and his hermeneutics provide the philosophical basis for my choice of connectedness. He describes uh, the theory and methodology of interpretation in a book called Truth and Method. He sees a fundamental difference, it's a bit complicated but I try to explain it, between two types of knowledge and one is uh, understanding as dialogue and that means that the needs of the other depend on the relationship with the interpreter. So together in our conversation we can reach a better understanding. And he sees another type of knowledge called knowledge as individual understanding. And that means we can see the needs of the other as given. They can be uncovered like a magician through a skillful act. An interpreter can fully discover the needs of the other person. I think that's the basic idea that hospitals are built on. Like a, an MRI scan, when you enter the hospital, this is what you have. Um, So, primary care uses the first model, I think, mostly. This deliberative model to make sense of uncertainty together. Because, but, but my problem is that because there are probably these two underlying ideas about the nature of understanding, primary care and secondary care do not always understand each other. It creates confusion. So, as, I, as you might understand uh, uh, after all this uh, talk from me, I choose connectedness as a 
score value. My focus is on dialogue. So um, how can we come to an understanding together? Uh, now I think many people require connected care, care that is specialist when it's needed, but generalists where possible. So I think in such a shifting environment, connections are more needed than ever. I would think that common ground would reduce overdiagnosis, unnecessary testing, and superfluous A&E visits. Connections, I think, also provide or prevent provide a burnout. I think that current care ambitions would require uh, closely connected care close to home. <coughs> to face this mix of diverse, increasingly well-informed and frail people. So the narrative, I think, now is of scaling up. Practices are getting bigger, and they have more and more non-GP staff. I think that's a good idea. Um, but how can we assist them, like in my case, to prevent fragmentation? How can we help them um, not have an over-reliance on procedures, on a lack of ownership? Simple things like tea breaks, shared tea breaks, can help. We did... Um, a ridiculously well-cited JAMA review um, in Manchester that showed that good teams have the time to sit down. They might function better if there's a moment in the day when they share experiences. And Jan Muller, in his practice, that was a 10 o'clock coffee time. So I think primary care might well need fewer GPs if the teams work well. So now I come to my third bit, sorry about plans. I'll just touch briefly upon some, plans, uh, upon some plans for teaching and for research, and I'll, I'll finish with a summary of what I told you and do some recommendations. So as I said, practices need help to deal with um, tensions around finding common ground, chronicity, confirmation, concierge, coding, and the crew. And a lot of this is actually about talking, about teaching, um, talking, teaching communication, teaching communication tools. So I think in that respect, managing the patient's expectation is probably the key. It's not a simple idea, by the way. My pain should have been better. A symptom like pain can become an indicator of illness. My tired patient could have developed chest pain, for instance. He could have developed a heart attack, a heart problem. But in the real world, pain, I think, mostly stays pain. It's just pain, symptom. As was the case for my patient, he kept having this tiredness. So how best to deal, I think, with such question is the bread and butter of general practice. Contextual, real-world stuff. So I think the, real, the simple truth is that in, pra uh, in general practice, all questions are important. And not just the questions that concern symptoms. I think how we deal with those symptoms determines how effective clinical relationships can be. One thing, for instance, more questions in a consultation means better consultations. Uh, a consultation, by the way, is made, if we're talking about plans for teaching, of three connected bids, usually, and each lasts about three minutes. And all these come into play when a patient walks into the consulting room. These bids need to be connected to work, and they need to be connected to impact on expectations that people have. And first, as I said, the reason for encounter, I think, is probably crucial. And there, then there is the, reach, the working hypothesis, and finally, the doctor and the patient will come up with a plan. And I think Dutch GPs will find that the reason for the encounter is the key to a proper consultation. If you know why the patient comes in, it sounds very simple. You can give them a good answer. So they focus on what brings the patient to the surgery. And we feel that time invested in the first three minutes would always pay back later on. But it seems to me, I might be wrong, that there's less interest in this crucial concept in the UK. Talking about knives and tools, this is probably the best tool that I know so far. The reason for the encounter, by the way, is not always a symptom. It can be all kinds of things. Like, I feel lonely. Will this spot go away? And GPs always face a communication dimension. How to connect, how to explain for this particular person. Most symptoms do not, real, do not really indicate medical issues, but all are important to patients. I think the only thing that usually helps is to stay around, to link up with them, to tell them when they can come to see you again. 
So I think the second part of the consultation is about the working hypothesis or the, the diagnosis. And that's the part that I think medical schools traditionally focus on. What's the diagnosis? What's the differential diagnosis? It would open the door to traditional medical knowledge. And I think it often rests on uh, ruling out options. That can take a lot of time. The doctor asks a lot of questions, does examinations, asks, uh, performs tests, does x-rays, whatever. But I think, I think in practice, in general practice, most of the time, the working hypothesis, and that's why it's so complicated, is everything is normal. But how do you explain normal findings to someone who is anxious or is worried about what's wrong in 9.22 minutes? That is far from simple, usually. That takes some time to learn, I would think. And then the third bit, that's usually the most neglected bit of the consultation, also for me, is about the management plan. You have three minutes, and you probably run out of time in the first three minutes. You run out of time in the second three minutes. And then you have two minutes left to explain what you're going to do, which is usually write the prescription and uh, tell the patient to see you uh, in two weeks or something. So that is usually a very difficult bit to learn. But I'm sure that our excellent new teaching group with Duncan, Shrewsbury, Max Cooper, Wynne, Fakudom, and all our new teaching fellows will look well at how we can better teach the structure of a consultation. I think that's really important. I, th I hope they will bring in more medical community-based generalism into the revised curriculum. And I hope to help them with teaching and writing. Um, and another thing I would think is important, and I'm really happy to see people from the Wellsborn practice, is that we need to teach students how they can partake in teams. How can you work in teams in a way that doesn't mean that you are responsible for everything as a GP? I think that's a big challenge. Um, I learned this from Jan Mulder already. The team is always better than the parts. A truly team-based approach would help us to organize the continuity of care that our multimorbid patients would need. Um, and I think that local practices such as the Wellsborn show that that model is the future. Well-run teams would save us from fragmentation, even if we have short-term consultations. But um, you need some kind of connectedness to offer continuity to define with ill-defined conditions. Connectedness would help the patients to co-design, to own and to acknowledge their symptoms and to organize self-management. It would avoid confusion, I think, reduce anxiety. And I think it's particularly important for older people and for their needs. And also, I think, it means community engagement. For us as a medical school, it requires a clear understanding of what doctors can bring to a team. As learning outcomes, for instance, how can you learn to work in a team when you're not responsible for everything, but for your medical bit mostly? So I think self-knowledge, to know your own skills, to know your own uh, person in a way, is probably crucial for connectedness. And, and I think for a medical school, it's really important to have our students learn about teams. What role are you going to play in a team? I think GPs will become primary care consultants. They will focus on the more complex patients, necessarily. It's too much work. The routine stuff is dealt with by other people. I think also in shifting team roles. As I said, extending the GP training with one year is, is probably an attractive option. So coming back, my tensions, my tightness case, my choice of dialogue as the cornerstone of connected medical uh, knowledge and the current NHS uh, crisis all set the stage, as I said. But how can we improve connections? I hope to help the community to search for relationships in primary care, in both teaching and research. Um, for instance, students now need excellent marks for physical science or for maths to get into medical school. Um, but perhaps they need brilliant marks and social, uh, social skills more. It's also a question of how you select the right people. Uh, so a critical area for me is medical education. I look very much forward to working with the team um, around various MDs and, and on the area of medical education as a research subject as well. And I would really like to expand the... Um, excellent simulation surgeries that we have because they offer a wonderful way, I think, to test and to teach connection skills. Um, just to briefly tell you a bit about my research ideas, um, another key area of research interest, I think, is risk communication. 
in high need areas. This is probably uh, an area of the UK where there are several uh, places like uh, White Talk and, and Hastings and Rother um, where there are people um, who might need a bit of extra help. So a local critical focus for me is the prevention of cardiovascular disease. How can we help GPs to, build, to deal better with that significant issue? So we have two EU funded projects that link into this. One is called SPICES and the other one is called PRODIMOS. Both are mixed methods implementation research projects. That means it's about the real world. How will this work in the real world? Um, and we try to pull qualitative uh, and uh, <laughs> quantitative methods in innovative ways. Um, and the project all combine, or try to combine, community engagement with digital and other tools, such as the DASH diet. I'll come back to that. Dietary approaches to stop hypertension, diet. Um, we're going to implement cardiovascular risk programs in vulnerable groups. This is one of the projects that aims to develop a greater understanding of what works in lay lifestyle teaching from a co-design perspective with mHealth and how can you help people to reduce their CVD and dementia risk. So I was in South Africa with Paprin, you can see her there on the right. Um, uh, and we had a wonderful meeting, I think, Paprin. Um, and um, this was about uh, the SPICES project, as you can, can see um, on the logo. Um, and this was about uh, a graduation ceremony for community health workers in the, um, Limpopo province in uh, Polokwane. And there were 64 nurses. Um, this was on Facebook, so the rights are okay. Um, and they were really happy and they were singing. I couldn't bring that for you, but if you want, I can show you later. Uh, they were singing in the most amazing way. They were wonderfully happy. This was uh, one of their songs. Uh, and you can see the Spices logo um, on the um, uh, documents that they now have. And they were really happy with that. So I think that's probably one of the biggest um, uh, results I've uh, achieved over the last year to work with these people um, in, uh, in South Africa. Prodimos, by the way, is um, uh, about an app to see where people can reduce their own dementia risk. I think uh, it's crucial mostly to, work, to ground this work locally. So I'm really very fortunate to be able to work with uh, Darren Snow, I saw him earlier. Where are you, Darren? Ah, Darren, Darren Snow and the wonderful people at the Crew Club in Whitehawk. Thanks very much for the help so far. Uh, so I want to invite all my colleagues to <coughs> uh, participate in a dialogue with me to help build communities, I think, where the need is greatest. Um, a new Brighton PhD student, I hope, starts early next year, and she would look at novel ways where uh, to, to organize care in, in underserviced areas such as Whitehawk. And with Darren, Graham Allen, Mary Dawkin, Carl Walker, Papreen, Chanu, Sadwani, where's Ch Chanu, I show you? Oh, there. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't see you after the student. Um, we, we are, and Liz Ford, our new senior lecturer in research methodology, um, I think we aim to build a nice portfolio of relevant research as well, not only teaching but also research. And I think we all share this interest in community grounding. Um, user-led, asset-based development. So I think my overall analysis, my heartfelt wish, is that we figure out how to integrate care. How can we help the British Choir of Medicine to start singing from the same hymn sheet again? Nice English expression, huh? For a Dutch guy. Um, <laughs> I studied hard on that. Yeah. Um, I'm much of what primary care does is not pathology-based. It's not about... Um, uh, actual diseases so much, but it's still crucial, I think. It's about discussing, acknowledging, normalizing, investigating, and following up people over time. Not symptoms, worries, or disorders so much, but sick people. Um, it was interesting for me to look at Jan Groen's work, because I remember he was very strict in this. I would never be able to talk about an illness, but he always wanted to talk about sick people, ill people. So our focus, he taught us, was not to focus on on illnesses, but on focus on, on the sick. Um, just to give you an example, I thought that might be interesting for you, talking about tools might still be a bit abstract. This is called the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Questionnaire. It's a short version. And it's um, um, 10 questions, and this is about how many times have you had one of these in the last week, 
and you scored them from zero to seven. And um, I think uh, if you're below, below 27, it's not, you, 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 ha you don't have a Mediterranean diet. Uh, I'm happy to share that with you afterwards. But um, um, when I, I filled this in for the first time, I only ate one egg per week. So in, after doing this kind of research, I now eat usually three or four eggs a week, so my points go up. Um, this is a very simple tool, actually, but we think it might work for many countries in the world. It's called the DASH-Q questionnaire. So this is uh, one more slide about a waiting room in Uganda, uh, where the SPICES project um, is also um, uh, happening at the moment. So um, I think good illness, oh, sorry, good medicine, to wrap up, um, is really important, but it makes room for the general. I think it's crucial that it allows discussion with patients, with, uh, that it allows shared decision making, and, and that might sometimes be at the expense of the particular about, uh, yeah. So medicine, I think, cannot work without the space, without uh, generalist discussions about what people want in their lives. And I think BSMS, my compliments, is an excellent place, I think, to spread this message. So summarizing, I, I took you to the NHS stage, I think. I showed you my heroes and I discussed what I think is a need for care redesign. I presented my case, my six tensions, and I, I showed you a bit of philosophy of science. Um, and I added some research and teaching ideas. I hope to develop many more with you. Uh, so coming to the end of my lecture, I want to express my gratitude very much. Uh, most of all, I'd like to thank my... She's there. She looks a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost over. <laughs> my wife, Johan, for her continuing love and support. Thank you very much, Johan. We started talking a long time ago, 40 years ago, um, about why connections are fascinating. Uh, and since then, we've had many insightful discussions and that's really um, been um, a great light. Thanks very much, Johan, for all that support. I wouldn't be talking to these people in English mm. um, about the need for connections in care um, without you. Thanks very much. I would also like to thank my children, uh, Anne and Lot. Uh, my connection with you girls makes me the proudest. Um, I did an inaugural lecture in Manchester two years ago. And one of my colleagues, um, uh, um, a statistician from Zimbabwe, uh, Edmore, came back to me afterwards and he said, well, Harm, your lecture was interesting, but your children were able to, to tell me in 90 seconds what you took an hour to, exp <laughs> to not explain to me. So yeah, okay, that was good feedback. Um, I tried to do better this time. I, I hope to, to hear some, um, some feedback about that. Uh, so to see my family present and my, my good friend Otto is really a great joy. And most of all, thanks, Liz, there, Jackie, where's Jackie there, and Malcolm, um, for inviting me to come work here. Uh, it's been really a wonderful pleasure so far. Thanks also to uh, Sonia, Rosie, Linda, ladies, for being my, my uh, roommates. It's been a wonderful collaboration so far. I hope to continue that. Um, thanks for, for Katie Warner and the team for uh, supporting me for today's uh, lecture. It's been excellent, excellent support. So my overall message is please allow me, my colleagues, to assist you in realizing your dreams. Uh, I, I would really like to help you with that. Thank you all for your attention. And now may I introduce Professor Malcolm Reed, Dean of BSMS, uh, to conclude the proceedings.